Welcome everyone. I hope that you had a good week this week and I look forward to spending the time with you today uh, studying God's Word together. Before we take some time to pray, uh, I just want to thank you for uh, praying for myself and our church leadership team as we have been, uh, we met this past Monday and uh, discussed uh, about how we need to move forward in uh, the process and the policies and procedures of being able to have in-person uh, worship services once again. And uh, as a part of that discussion, we have decided that uh, we're going to aim for June 21st to have uh, our first in-person uh, worship services with, of course, AHS restrictions in place. And uh, you should have already received information about that uh, with, a, with a, a survey question, either by email or on Facebook. Uh, if you've not seen that yet, then I would encourage you to go look in your email uh, or look at Facebook on our group or on, the, on our page, church page. And uh, if you can't find that in either one of those places, uh, it should be posted on our church web page. So jpbc.ca. Any one of those places, you should be able to find the information as we uh, are trying to help you all understand and uh, give you the opportunity to know what's, what's going to happen and what it's all going to look like uh, when we first get started and uh, that process. And we're going to need your patience and your help as we go through this process because we'll, we'll be learning all together about how to do this in a new way. And so I would ask that you would cont continue to be praying for us as a, as a church leadership team as we uh, do our, the work that's necessary in order for us to accomplish that. And just be praying for us as a, as a church as a whole as uh, we uh, seek God for His wisdom and guidance as to know how we need to do what we need to do in order to go forward. And uh, uh, as the uh, Alberta continues to uh, you know go through its phases of, of opening and, and launching and so this whole relaunch process uh, we'll, we'll need to all work together uh, just as God intended for us as a church to do is to is to be there together and and help each other and, and work together so let's do our best to do that and, and we really appreciate your prayers let's take time now uh, before we study God's Word uh, important for us to focus our hearts and our minds uh, and ask that the Holy Spirit would teach us, would guide us, uh, and would help us to understand what He wants us to learn today. So let's take a moment uh, to bow in a word of prayer and ask that the Holy Spirit would do that uh, for us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are once again so very thankful to You for Your love and Your grace and Your mercy that You pour out on us each and every day and how You have kept us and provided for us in uh, varying ways uh, through this uh, time of life that uh, just is a, a new way of, of doing things and in this new uh, environment of uh, what needs to be done and, and how things are going. And, and so whether that we've had difficult times or not, you have been there walking with us through each step of that process. And we know you will continue to walk with us. And so we are so thankful to you. Uh, we pray that you will continue to help us in the plans and uh, in the procedures so that we might be able to start that process of being able to once again gather together uh, in small groups at first, uh, but begin that process of being able to gather and worship together in person. Uh, boy, do we look forward to that day, and Father, I pray your, your help in that. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would guide our hearts and our minds and our spirits today as we study your word. Uh, help us to understand what you want us to learn. Uh, teach us. Help us to have humble hearts and teachable spirits uh, that you would be able to uh, work in us and mold and shape us to be the people that you desire for us to be. We give this time to you, Lord. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, today, huh, if I can get my notes to work, we're going to uh, take some time to look at a passage 
in Romans chapter 12. Actually, I want to focus in on uh, the, the verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And we're going to look at what it means to be transformed uh, and, and, and what this passage has to say about that. So if you have your Bibles, I hope that you will uh, have them with you and that you will look with me uh, e- uh, either digitally or in the, in the book and uh, find Romans chapter 12, verse 2 which in the NIV says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Uh, This is one of my favorite passages uh, in uh, in the New Testament. Uh, I uh, have memorized, as you you can see, memorized uh, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, actually, and, and it's my... Uh, desire my goal to try to eventually memorize the entire chapter of uh, chapter 12. But I want to focus in here on on verse 2. Uh, but, but, but just before we go into verse 2, I want to just briefly look at verse 1. Uh, because remember always when we're studying God's Word, we don't want to take anything out of context. We, gotta make, we need to make sure that when we're reading God's Word, that we're understanding the context of what it is. Uh, too many times uh, people run into trouble and get themselves into difficulty and, and get out on the wrong path when they take just one verse out of the Bible and, and try to use it to explain things without understanding the context in which that verse sits. And so we need to understand here that uh, this verse 2 has some great information in it, but it sits on the foundation of the passages before it. And so uh, if we look at verse one, uh, which, as we read it, we'll see, alerts us to the whole uh, first 11 chapters prior to this as the foundation, the setting for what Paul is going to teach in these next verses. And so, because verse one says this, if you're there in chapter 12, just back up to verse one and uh, look with me there, where it says, Uh, Again, in the NIV, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now, you'll notice that right at the beginning of that verse, it starts off by saying, Therefore, Paul is the writer of uh, the letter of Romans. Uh, he was writing to the the Jewish and Christian, uh, Jewish and Gentile Christians that were living in Rome, and he was uh, sending them this letter to help them better understand uh, what the truth is of, of Jesus coming and his death and his resurrection and, and, and why it is that Jesus has come. He's giving them some foundation understanding of how to live their lives and how to live their lives together as. Those coming from a Jewish tradition and those coming from a uh, a Gentile tradition coming together as followers of Christ. And so he starts off chapter 12 by saying, therefore. And and what he's alerting us to, he's saying, based on all that I've taught you in this beginning of this letter, in the first 11 chapters, based on that, this is what I want you to understand. Now, I don't want to go into all of what the first 11 chapters, what Paul said there. But I I found a a, a nice summary in my uh, Bible app, in the the preface to the book of Romans, the letter of Romans. And so I just want to read a portion of that for you that hopefully will help you understand uh, a little bit, just sort of brief summary of what those first 11 chapters are about. And uh, the author of the preface uh, in this case writes this, The flow of the letter follows the pattern of the ancient Jewish story of slavery and rescue. Humanity is an exile due to the entrance of sin and death into the world. Even the Jewish law could not defeat death and bring life. But God has come to rescue both Jews and Gentiles through the death and resurrection of Jesus. A new worldwide family is being created. Baptism into Jesus breaks the power of evil and brings freedom. 
the Holy Spirit leads the way into this new life that will be complete in a new inheritance, a redeemed creation. Now, that's, that's a brief summary of what it is that Paul is trying to, or is attempting to teach the, the people in Rome uh, through this letter to the Romans. And so, take that into context as you understand that that's a lot of what he's been saying and teaching in the first 11 chapters. And then we hit chapter 12, and he says, therefore, based on all of that, I want you to understand, therefore, in view of God's in mercy. Now, what, is that, what does that mean? Well, well, what he's talking about there is what he's described already, and that is the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's, it's God's mercy on us. All of us as people are born into sin. Because of the sin that happened uh, in, in the Garden of Eden by Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed God, sin entered into creation, into the world, into the universe. And since then, all of us are born into sin. Uh, and we're not able to pay the price for our sin. That Our sin separates us from God. And so because God loves us, or as Paul says here, because of God's mercy on us, uh, he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth. He was born, lived, taught, but for the primary purpose of dying on the cross and raising from the dead three days later to pay for our sins and overcome the power of death, the penalty of death that was upon us, that we might have eternal life through, through Jesus' act of uh, salvation, or his act of death on the cross that gave us salvation from our sins. Uh, and so because of his act uh, of doing that, we have the opportunity to have a relationship with God. We have that opportunity to have eternal life. And so when Paul is saying, in view of God's mercy, that's what he's referring to. That's the mercy that he's talking about, that God has given us that mercy. So he's saying, based on all that I've taught you, in view of the mercy that God has had upon us, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. So he's setting the foundation here to say that this is the kind of relationship that we're entering into with God. That we have given our lives to him as a living sacrifice. So we, before Jesus, the Israelites had to uh, take animals and sacrifice them. So actually they had to die in order to pay for sins. But thankfully, because of Jesus' death on the cross, no longer does there have to be a, a, a sacrifice of something to die. Jesus paid once and for all that final debt, his death on the cross, and, and thankfully conquering death and raising again three days later. But that was the last death that had to happen in order to pay for sin. So there's no longer that need. But there is, in the process of our relationship with God, the need for us to be... Uh, offering our bodies, giving ourselves to Him as a sacrifice, but a living sacrifice. That each and every day we give our lives to Him, that He's the Lord and Savior of our life, that He's our master. No longer are we a master to ourselves or a master to uh, money or to uh, fame and fortune, to anything else that's out there. Instead, we have made that decision and that choice to make him the master of our lives. And so daily, we live our lives as a living sacrifice. And it says here, holy and pleasing to God. Uh, it's, it's because of God's mercy it's because of God sending His Son Jesus and His death on the cross that we're able, His, His cleansing blood washed us white as snow, is what Scripture tells us. It washed away the sin, and, in, and, and by His uh, sacrificial act on our behalf, as we stand before God, He sees us clean and white as snow, that in order for us to come before a holy God and be in relationship with a holy God, we had to be holy. And the only way that could happen is by Jesus making us holy through his merciful act. 
And so because of that mercy, he's saying that we need to daily sacrifice our life as a, li as a living sacrifice. That as we live our lives, what we do with our lives, that it would be, we would be holy before God and pleasing in all we do. And he says that this is your spiritual act of worship. Because we're going to dive into that in verse 2, that we recognize that since we have come into this new relationship with God through Jesus' mercy on the cross for us, we now not just have a physical life, but we have a spiritual life. And God created the physical, but before the physical was, God existed uh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, living in community, living as one God, and yet three persons, existing in the spiritual realm. So the, the, the Spirit of God existed before the physical realm. And so the, the physical is just something that is temporary, something that he's created that is going to be for as long as he decides it's going to be here. And the Bible does teach us that there is going to come a time and a point where the physical uh, world is and universe is going to come to an end and uh, he's the rest of his plan is going to play out and, and based on our decision on this earth and how we decide whether to give our lives to him in this way that, that he's talking about here in uh, in verse 1 will determine our eternity whether we'll have eternal life or eternal death and so he's saying, based on this new life we have in him, we have a spiritual life that allows us to come before a spiritual God, a God of spirit, and a holy God, that we're able to do that holy and in spirit. So that sets the tone. That sort of gives us the foundation as we then look into verse 2, which is what I want us to focus on. So let's start off at verse 2 with the first, the first phrase there. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. So now Paul is saying, based on this foundation that, that, I've just, that we've just talked about, that he's ex been explaining, based on all of that, due to God's mercy and how we need to now live our lives in, in holy and in spirit, as a, as a, a spiritual act of worship and, and, and as, a, as a living sacrifice to God, then what needs to happen is that we need to not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. We need to not think like the world, way the world thinks. We need to not act the way the world acts. We need to not live our lives the way the world lives their life. We need to not look at the world and perceive the things that go about us and, and to go about the ways of making our decisions the way the world has done them because we're not the same as we were before. Uh, and so if we're going to live our lives serving God, loving Him, following Him, and, and loving others, then we need to put our old way of thinking aside that once we're renewed, once we have that mercy that, that Jesus has given to us on the cross, that that old way has gone, uh, that old way of thinking is done. And Paul is making it very clear for us here that he's saying, do not, con do not think that way. Don't think the way of, that the world does anymore. In fact, uh, if we look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. If you want to look in your Bibles, follow uh, me as I read this. Uh, we see that John refers to something similar. Uh, he he uh, makes the same point, uh, this important point that Paul is making. And so in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17 says this, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Paul is 
writing this letter to the Romans to help them, to teach them. Now, it was not just God's intent for this teaching to be for those people at that time. He has preserved it in the Bible so that it is truth that is being taught for the ages. And so this truth applies to us. And so this teaching, this truth that Paul is revealing in this letter of Romans is for us today. And he's telling us we need to stop living our life the way we used to live it. We, it, it and it right down to the way we think, the pattern of our thoughts needs to change from the way the world does it to the way God thinks, to, 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 the, to, to kingdom-minded thinking, to a spiritual pattern of thinking. And so we need to be very aware, uh, pay attention to whether or not when we're living our life, if our mind ends starts to, to go back to its old habits of its old way of thinking. See, in, in the pattern of the world, it's all about me. It's about taking care of my needs. It's about meeting my goals. It's about doing what feels good to me, uh, what, uh, what I like to do, what is best for me or what's best for my family, but it's always about sort of me-centered. But in God's kingdom, everything is Christ-centered. It, it, it all flows through the central idea of Jesus and the gospel of his message. And so the kingdom of God, therefore, the, the pattern of thought is totally different. It's not about me. Now it's about God and about his will, about his son, Jesus Christ, and his mercy that he has brought to the world, his message of good news of salvation for the world, and living according to his pattern of thinking, which is in a way of selflessness. It's a pattern of patience. It's a pattern of thinking of others first, before me. It's a pattern of forgiving others when they do something wrong to me. And so that's just a, a few examples, but as you continue to read and study God's Word, you learn more and more about what it means to have a spiritual pattern of thinking. And so Paul is very clearly stating here, we need to no longer be a part of that world's way of thinking, but have a spiritual pattern of thinking. Then he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that's what happens when you no longer are conforming to the world's way. You receive God's mercy uh, of, of salvation through Jesus Christ. And now because of that, you go away from the, old, the world's way of thinking. And he transforms your mind, transforms you by the renewing of your mind. Now there's a new pattern of thinking, a new way of looking at life, of uh, receiving and understanding and perceiving the world around us. It's now done from a different perspective. It's done from God's perspective, not from our perspective. A little tiny hole like this that we used to look like when we had the mindset of the world, but now we have a much bigger perspective because we're being able to see it through a spiritual dynamic, through a godly understanding, perception of the world. And that completely transforms us. Praise the Lord. What an amazing gift that God desires to transform us from, from the old way that we were, wretched as we were, uh, draped in sin and uh, headed towards destruction and death and stumbling and faltering and the burdens of the world and life around us. And now that we've received the mercy of, of that God has given us through Jesus and his death on the cross, and we've got this relationship with Almighty God and we're in a holy relationship with him, he totally transforms us, cleanses us, renews us, gives us a brand new understanding of the world, his vision and his world view, 
instead of our own, and it, it transforms how we do everything. It transforms how we make our decisions. It transforms how we act to others. It transforms our mind, our thinking. He says here, by the renewing of our mind. In fact, Jesus says in Luke chapter 24, verse 45, he's talking, teaching a bunch of people, and he says to them, or he, he doesn't say, but it says that Jesus does this, that then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. See, God's word to people who don't believe in God don't make, doesn't make a lot of sense. Sorry, that's not very good English. Doesn't make very good sense because they're looking at it with worldly eyes and a worldly mindset. There is a lot of teaching and a lot of truths in the Bible that a non-believer is simply not capable of understanding because their spiritual eyes have not been opened. But what Paul is teaching us here in this passage, and what it says here that Jesus did to the people, is that by entering into the kingdom of God, by giving our life to him and receiving his mercy, that he opens our mind and opens our eyes so that we're able to understand the truths, the spiritual truths that are within Scripture, that then teach us and shape us and help to form us to be the people that God wants us to be. Uh, praising and worshiping and glorifying Him and a people that are going out and, and being about His mission of, of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with a world around that so desperately needs to be saved. Now, we also see this in John chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. Jesus, it says there, if you look with me, Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Now you might have heard that phrase before, a born again Christian. Well, that's where this, that phrase comes from, is this passage where Jesus is trying to teach Nicodemus to give him an understanding that we are born as flesh in a physical understanding, a physical mind and body, but there's more for us, waiting for us, if we're willing to receive God's mercy and go, come into a relationship with Him as our Lord and Savior, we now enter into a spiritual life. And so God gives us birth into a spiritual life, and as Paul is talking about in Romans 12 too, transforming us from this just one dimension physical uh, mind and body into also a spiritual mind and body, a spiritual understanding, a child of God with a perspective and an understanding that is much bigger and greater because he opens our eyes, because the Holy Spirit helps us to see things in a spiritual perspective, we can be completely and utterly transformed. That's what God wants for us in our life. That's what Paul is teaching us. That's the reason, one of the reasons I love this verse is because it's so exciting that the understanding and realization that we don't have to be left stuck in the difficulty of, of life and the burden that we are in, but because Jesus enters into our life when we receive him as our Lord and Savior, he transforms us completely. What a gift from God. Uh, we need to realize that because Satan is battling against this. He, he doesn't want people to follow God. He, he, he wants to hurt God by causing people to reject him. And so he tries to get us to, 
get into our old habits of thinking away the world does, living our life uh, ensnared and enslaved back in that worldly way of doing things. But Paul is reaffirming to us and encouraging us that our minds have now been transformed. Now he then says that due to this, that we are able to test and approve what God's will is. Boy, how many times have I had someone ask me, I don't know what God's will is for my life. Well, this is part of the answer to that question. If we allow ourselves, if we give ourselves to God, and we recognize that we've entered into this spiritual relationship with Him because of His mercy for us, that we're cleansed and we live in a spiritual and a holy relationship with God, that we've had this transforming of our mind, not world, the world's way of thinking anymore, but a, a spiritual pattern of thinking, we now are able to test and approve what God's will is. That's God's promise to us. If we're living our life focused on Him, worshiping Him, spending time in communication, in communing with Almighty God through prayer and reading God's Word, that's how we spiritually connect to God. And in verse 1, talking about offering our bodies as a, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, that this is our spiritual act of worship. As we continue to engage in that relationship in that way, God's promising us that we will be able to then, with those spiritual eyes and that spiritual mind, will be able to test and approve what God's will is. We'll be able to see where God is at work. We'll be able to see God's activity. We'll be able to start to understand when God is speaking to us and telling us what it is that He wants us to do. What our place is in His plan for our life. Now, I'm not saying that He just lays out the whole rest of your life for you so that you don't have to worry about it. He as a part of that relationship, it requires us to trust Him. So He might not give us the whole plan, the whole story, but He starts to give us the next step that we need to do. And because our mind is able to understand and to see spiritual things, we're then able to see His spiritual plan for our life, and we're able to uh, live that out with more confidence, with more trust in Him, with more a blessing that comes with living in that kind of relationship with a holy God. This is what Paul is promising us in this passage. He ends by saying that not only will we be able to test and approve what God's will is, but it, that it is His good, pleasing, and perfect will. He's giving us a promise here that God's way of doing things is not random, is not willy-nilly, is not uh, unfair, is not, but it is pleasing, it is perfect, it is good for us. If we look in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11, God is teaching the Israelites this, and this truth, this teaching still applies to us. Sometimes we just focus on the New Testament and forget the truths that God teaches in the Old Testament, which is the foundation for what He teaches us in the New Testament. And so this still applies to us today, this promise that God gives to, through the prophet Jeremiah. In chapter 29, verse 11, God says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. When we understand that God's will for us is good, pleasing, and a perfect will, we start to understand that He loves us and desires to prosper us, not to harm us. If we go back to last week's message, we, we can apply that 
truth that we learned last week here, talking about trusting God and trusting His process. When we live in a relationship in this way with a transformed mind and a, and a spiritual understanding and perspective in our relationship communing with God, we start to understand His will. God opens our eyes to the truth of Scripture and to the truth of the things that are around us and His activity and what He's doing in and around us and through our lives, we begin to realize that we can trust God and His process, that His will is good for us. He loves us and He desires to do what is good for us and that we're not harmed by it. Now that doesn't mean that we don't have difficult things that we have to go through. A lot of times going through those difficult things is God's will because it's a way that He can use to teach us, to mold us, to strengthen us, to help us to learn to trust Him more, to help us to learn to listen to Him more, to help us to learn to get away from our worldly way of thinking and to learn more about what it means to live with a spiritual mindset, a kingdom mindset, a transformed mind where all that we do is centered around Christ. When we start to grasp that and understand that, oh, what a change that begins. It's like uh, a snowball effect. Because once we start this process, once we engage in God in this type of relationship and, and have this kind of, we, we practice this kind of understanding, and I don't mean, I mean practice by that we actually live it out in our lives, it starts to become the process that as we, our mind is transformed and we start to see God's will and we start to obey Him and we start to live His will out, then we are our, our mind is transformed even more and we start to recognize Him more clearly and we start to hear His voice more clearly and we become more transformed and our mind becomes more renewed and it's, it's a continual process. That's why I think Paul uses the word renewing, not our mind is renewed, sort of a one-time, zunk, finish, done, complete, but that it is continually being renewed. It's continuous in the process. It's continuous in the growth. And we continue to grow and transform in our spiritual understanding, in our perspective of life, in our understanding of God's kingdom and His desire for us and His desire for the world around us and what part we play in that uh, plan with recognizing that Christ is the center that it's all about Him, through Him, for Him, and uh, by Him that the world can be saved. That He is the main character. We're not the heroes in our own story. The story is about Jesus and we play characters in that story of Him and who the world is. Remember, it's He that created the universe. It's He that created us, not us. It's the worldly way of thinking that puts us in the center of our world and our life and makes us the hero of our story. But that's not the kingdom way. That's not God's way. That's not the way that brings peace and eternal life. What brings that is an understanding that God is at the center in His Son, Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ. Because He's the one who spoke everything into existence. It's us, as a living sacrifice, giving ourselves to Him, that we might be able to live our lives in this new transformed understanding, this new transformed life and mindset, that we begin to be able to understand and to experience life with the joy and the blessing that God desires for us. But it requires us to engage with God through the mercy of Jesus Christ in this relationship and in this way that Paul has described here in order for us to be able to uh, experience this life the way God wants us to experience it. I hope that you're able to 
soak that all in today. And I also hope that you are experiencing God's transforming power in your life. I hope this was just a reminder. But one of the things that I know is that there are people out there who aren't experiencing that transforming power. And so I'm excited if you are experiencing that. Either way, if you need to talk more about this, this whole concept, all that I have, have laid out for you today, you want to talk more about a transformed life uh, and having a spiritual mind, uh, kingdom-minded understanding and, and, a, and a spiritual pattern of our mind rather than the world's pattern of thinking. If you want to talk to me more about that, I would uh, love to uh, you know, answer any of your questions, maybe about how God transforms us and about uh, kingdom living and a kingdom mind. Uh, you can contact me by email. Uh, many of you already know my email, but for anyone who might be watching for the first time, uh, you can email me at jc at jpbc.ca. Or if you prefer to text, which is great, lots of people uh, prefer texting nowadays, we have a, a church text line that you can text uh, and contact me. Uh, that number is 587-840-6070. Uh, so that should be appearing on the bottom of your screen right now. I also want to say that if this is the first time you've understood that God had mercy on you, yes, you personally, by dying on the cross and paying the price, the cost for your sin, so that you could have freedom from that sin and have a new, a reborn life in Him, a spiritual life with the Holy Father that has created all that exists. If this is the first time that you've understood that and you want to know more about that, you want to know more about how uh, you're you can enter into this relationship with God. How it is that God has, through His Son Jesus, has paid for your sins and, and wants to give you a new life. He wants to make you a new creation. Uh, and that's something that you've been looking for. And you'd like to, uh, to know more about that. I would love to talk to you. I would highly encourage you uh, if, if that's the situation you're in, if, if that's the decision you would like to consider making uh, or that you really want to make to give your life to God and receive His mercy and, and forgiveness for your sins and, and have that relationship with Him and have eternal life, if that's the decision you'd want to make, then I would encourage you to go ahead and text into our church line. Just text the word BELIEVE uh, to that number. 587-840-6070. And that way I can connect with you and uh, we can uh, chat or, or find a way to, to, to uh, communicate with each other and uh, help you uh, with whatever questions you might have or help you to know what are the next steps after making that decision in, in your relationship and in your new life with the God who loves you and cares for you. Uh, that would be the most important decision you could ever make in your life. Uh, and I hope if you're considering it, that you will do that today. Uh, I pray that we understand the mercy that God has given us. I hope and pray that even in the midst of the, these difficult times that are surrounding us, that we understand that God has our back, that God loves us and is taking care of us. Uh, he is, he is, he loves and cares for everyone. He has those of us who have uh, given our lives to him and have entered into a relationship with him. He has us in his hand and he's taking care of them. With his other hand, he's calling and motioning the rest of the world. Please, please, I want you to come in and to have a family with me. That's what we, uh, that's the truth and that's the desire for our life and, and that's the desire for my life that, that we get to see that and be a part of that, a, a part of God's mission. What, what a, a wonder it is when we realize that. And we need to remind ourselves 
of that more often. We need to be praying for each other. So I hope you will be doing that this week. Let's take time right now just to bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and thankful to you for how you love us, uh, that you had mercy on us and sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross, to pay for our sins, to be that final sacrifice uh, of, of death uh, uh, and sacrifice to pay the penalty but so thankful that three days later he rose again, uh, that he has power over death and that we have uh, eternal life and through him a relationship with you. Father, thank you that you transform our mind, uh, that you renew us, uh, that you, through this, allow us to have a spiritual perspective and an understanding of who you are, that we might understand your will and your kingdom plans, and that we get to be a part of your kingdom work. And so, Lord, I pray that you would continue to help us to do that. I pray your hand on each person out there who may be listening, uh, that needs help understanding this more, uh, that, Lord, for any of those who still do not know you, that you would open their eyes, that they might be able to see and understand the truth so that they can receive uh, your great and wondrous mercy. Father, we we pray for each person that you help them to have a, a week that is relying on you and that they have a spiritual mindset as they look at each part of this week, that they would trust you and they would trust your process. Father, we are so thankful to you. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I sincerely hope that you felt that you were in the presence of God today as you worshipped him through the studying of his word. Uh, I hope that uh, you heard him speak to you personally. Uh, Just exactly what it is that you needed to hear today, God opened your ears and helped you to see that and understand that. Uh, That you... uh, feel renewed in some way today uh, by this encounter that we've had with God's truth in his word. I pray that you will have a blessed week and I hope that you will join us back here again uh, next week. God bless.